So before I begin, I'd like to thank the University of Obst Club for graciously inviting me to present this lecture today. I am seldom invested with the opportunity to introduce the study of philosophy to larger audiences, and the university, I assume, was uh, free to select other speakers for this particular occasion. So I'm deeply grateful, and I treat my presence here today as a privilege. Now, as I mentioned, one of my purposes here today will be to introduce you to the study of philosophy, but to this end I'll spend very little direct effort. Scandalously, within philosophy, the definition of philosophy itself is a controversial issue, so I can't rightly give an introductory lecture by canvassing my views on what philosophy is or consists in and so on, since that would be contentious. To avoid this problem, all of my direct efforts will instead be spent on the task of introducing you to Descartes. This way, I can avoid spreading prejudices about what philosophy's proper definition is and jump straight into the activity of philosophy. I'll be leading by example, so to speak. But I'd be lying if I said this approach wasn't without drawbacks. Descartes is a historical figure, and most of his arguments aren't accepted by philosophers nowadays. So the picture you'll be getting of Descartes is not a purely philosophical picture insofar as it fails to reflect the state of contemporary philosophy. It'll have to be a partially historical picture. Which means I'll try to explain why he argued the things that he did, and what effects his arguments ha have had on the thinkers after him. For this reason, much of my talk here will be historical in character. Now, setting aside the disclaimers, let's get right into it. Who was René Descartes? Descartes was a French mathematician, philosopher, and scientist who was born in 1596 on March 31st, which was almost exactly 423 years ago. His birthday was yesterday, as of the time of this lecture, so we're a day off. To give you a sense for how long ago that was, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet was first performed in 1595, which was 424 years ago. Let's go over some of his achievements. In his lifetime, Descartes contributed significantly to mathematics and philosophy. In mathematics, he may rightly be described as the founder of analytic geometry. By synthesizing algebra and geometry, he invented the Cartesian coordinate system. This should sound familiar to you, the Cartesian coordinate system, but if it doesn't, a graphic on the next slide will jog your memory. Uh, it's a biaxial plane with units of length for coordination. It's still taught to this day in high school. Uh, I will add that it should be noted that the coordinate system was discovered independently at around the same time by Pierre, by Pierre de Fermat, but Descartes nonetheless deserves credit for his discovery. Now, despite his mathematical achievements, Descartes was, in his mind at least, first and foremost a scientist, and he created a whole new system of mechanistic physics. This work comprises a considerable portion of Descartes' corpus, but unfortunately for Descartes, his scientific work isn't accepted, uh, isn't accepted by modern scientists. He got quite a lot wrong. That said, he made some discoveries that have withstood the test of time and aren't wrong, like the Snell, De the Snell Descartes Law. Is a law describing the angles of the refraction, the refra refraction of light. He shares credit for this discovery with Snell. His many mistakes didn't prevent him from exerting a huge influence on science, however, and as such he is considered as the father of modern philosophy, and is recognized by scholars as a strong influence on the scientific revolution. We'll return to both of these facts throughout the lecture, so I won't explain them in detail here, but I will note that it's difficult to understand, to understate the portent of a designation like the father of modern philosophy. He was really that influential. So here's the Cartesian coordinate system. If you didn't already know, the word Cartesian comes from Descartes' name. Now, if we want to talk about Descartes' scientific and philosophical achievements meaningfully, we have to contextualize them historically. I'll only gloss over the history here as a more detailed and accurate picture is far beyond the scope of this lecture, but for the purposes of a sketch, my overview here uh, should suffice. The 17th century, which Descartes lived through, was a turbulent time. It was a watershed period in history, because three major revolutions had occurred. The world had been circumnavigated for the first time, Christianity was rocked by schism, and science was undergoing a revolution. The first image to the left is the cover of Francis Bacon's 1620 book, Novum Organum, a title which means the new instrument of science. In this book, Francis Bacon details his radical views about the correct procedure of science. 
Back in the 17th century, which is Descartes' time and Bacon's time, science was essentially still an inheritance from the ancient Greeks. The accepted cosmology at the time was geocentric, which means that the scholars of the time believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe and all the celestial bodies in the universe, like the stars, the moon, the sun, the other planets, all revolved around the Earth. This science was meeting increasing opposition. Galileo, for instance, began to challenge geocentrism in favor of a heliocentric view in which the Earth revolves around the Sun. We can see this depicted in the image in the bottom center. These are images of this scientific revolution. The old image of the world in science was changing and the new image of the world was replacing it. The cover for Bacon's book seems to represent the zeitgeist perfectly. Tall sailing ships in the sea facing a vast, unbroken horizon. There is a whole po ocean of possibility waiting to be explored in science, and figures like Bacon, Galileo, Descartes, Boyle, Kepler, and eventually Newton would go on to do so. But in the real world as well, uh, there were whole oceans to be explored. In 1492, Christopher, Christopher Columbus arrived in the Bahamas. In 1522, Magellan's expedition completed the first circumnavigation of the Earth. Europeans were exploring the oceans, and global maritime trade routes were formed. The Americas were described as a new world. Heavy scare quotes around new world, because obviously the Americas had always been there, but to the Europeans it must have seemed like they'd really discovered a new world. Because they were encountering more or less alien cultures, alien flora and fauna, and alien geography. And then, in, and then in 1517, Martin Luther published his 95 Theses and caused the Reformation, which is a religious upheaval the likes of which the world hasn't seen since. He's on the top right, nailing his theses to the door. That probably didn't actually happen, but it's more compelling to depict it like that. <laughs> Christians began to split into a so-called schism after these 95 Theses were published, when new, where new denominations of Christianity were formed. It was the end of Christian unity. The Protestant denomination, for example, was a direct result of the Refor Reformation. That's why we have Protestant churches and also Roman Catholic churches. As you'd expect, endless conflicts were generated by the Reformation, among which the Thirty Years' War was one. As the name suggests, the, la the war lasted a whole 30 years. Eight million people died. One horrific scene from the wars depicted in the bottom right, where we can see numerous soldiers being hanged from a tree. So we have three major historical uh, events defining the context for Descartes' time. The scientific revolution, the discovery of the new world and naval exploration, and the Protestant Reformation. It's not surprising that people would be interested in attaining certain knowledge in light of these earth-shaking revolutions. Descartes was no exception, as we will see later. So this is a picture of the geocentric universe. You can see the Earth in the center with the moon, or Luna, orbiting it, along with all the planets and then finally the stars on the outer layers. As I mentioned earlier, the scientific consensus in Descartes' time was that the universe was geocentric. Let's give the science of his time a name. Aristotelian science. Aristotelian science will be so named due to its profound debt to Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, the ancient Greek philosopher. Now let's go over some features of Aristotelian science. First, Aristotelians believed in substantial forms. This is a technical term consisting in two parts. Substance, as in substantial, and forms. Substance was an abstract term describing individual entities. So, for example, I am a substance, and so is my dog. You, the listener, are a distinct substance from me or my dog. Uh, so what makes a substance distinct from another substance? We've already sort of accepted that substances can be distinct, but what exactly is it that makes us distinct? One intuitive answer might be that substances have different properties. Form would account for these properties. Forms differentiate substances. So for example, me and you were made of presumably the same kinds of physical things, unless you're an alien or an artificial intelligence or any kind of non-human entity. Uh, so that means we are constituted by the same matter, the same material. But we're clearly different because we have different properties. I don't know what you look like, and you don't know what I look like, but it doesn't seem like a stretch to assume that we look different. Form accommodates for this difference. 
Another example, if we have a ball of putty, and then we sculpt it into a distinct structure from the ball, then it's clearly changed. But the matter remains the same. What's changed is the form of the putty. Now the next point we have here is hylomorphism, which is the very bare distinction in the first place between form and matter that we've already been talking about. Hylomorphism is distinct from substantial forms because substantial forms analyses were applied in Aristotelian science, but hylomorphism is the bare distinction itself between form and matter. Now the question now seems to be this. How on earth could I know the substantial forms we see in nature? Aristotle's answer was that we could trust our sensory experience. Wherever we perceive objects, we understand intuitively what its form is. So if I see a color out there in nature, for instance, uh, it's a matter of the form of the object that its color really is a property of the object. So if I see grass and I see that it's green, the grass really is green. The greenness is really in that object as a matter of its form. This is an important point, so please keep this in mind. Now, methodologically speaking, Aristotle thought that we could make deductions or deduce from our observations of nature and our intuitive judgments about substantial forms. Aristotle believed as well that there are four kinds of causes and four elements in the world. The four kinds of causes affect the different features of the objects in the world. A material cause affects the matter of an object, the formal cause its form, the efficient cause brings objects into being, and final causes affect the purposes of objects. I'll focus on final causes here uh, just for a moment uh, because I think it's important. Aristotle believed in final purposes, which is to say that he believed that all natural phenomena were purposive or had purposes. So for example, an acorn's purpose would be to grow into a tree. Using this notion of final cause, Aristotelians would try to come up with scientific explanations. Uh, once again, we can explain the acorn by referencing its purpose, which is to grow into a tree. As for the four elements, I will assume that everyone's already familiar with this, but very quickly, uh, Aristotelians believe that there are four elements in the world that constituted everything else in the world. Earth, water, air, and fire. That is to say, everything in the world was made up of either one of these elements or a combination of them. And I've added humors at the end here. We won't really talk about them in depth, but Aristotelians believe that there were humors in human bodies that determined our personalities. For instance, if I had too much black bile, quote-unquote, quote uh, in my body, my personality would become melancholic or sad. Famously, humors are prominent in many of Shakespeare's plays. Now... Which of these features did Descartes accept? Did he accept substantial forms? No. Did he accept hylomorphism? No. Intuition and reliance on the senses? Nope. Deduction? Bizarrely, no. The four causes? No. The four elements? No. Humors? Absolutely not. Descartes rejected all of these features in varying degrees. For example, he seems to accept some kinds of appeals to intuition, but not the Aristotelian kinds. It is crucial to understand that Aristotelian science was his target. He wanted to change the nature of science in general, and overturning Aristotelian science was the precondition for that change that he was seeking. Naturally, he rejected geocentrism as well, and was a heliocentrist. I'll read out one of his quotes here in a letter to his friend Mersenne. If heliocentrism is false, all the foundations of my philosophy are false also, for they demonstrate it clearly. And it is so connected with all the parts of my treatise, that I would not know how to eliminate it without great harm to the rest. The treatise that Descartes mentions here is his treatise on the light, also known as The World. He started writing it in 1629, but was stopped abruptly in 1633 when Galileo was condemned by the church for his heliocentrism. Descartes was a good Christian, and he didn't want to upset the, <laughs> upset the church, so he avoided explicitly espousing his heliocentric views. But he was still committed to the kind of new science that Bacon and Galileo were pushing for, so he tried more or less to trick people into abandoning Aristotelian science. <laughs> I have a quote here from another letter to his friend, Mersenne, where he reveals uh, his intent to co covertly wean his Aristotelian contemporaries off the old Aristotelian ways. He says, 
Between you and me, I shall tell you that these six meditations contain all the foundations of my physics. But please, one must not say this, for those who favor Aristotle would perhaps make more difficulty about approving them. I hope that my readers will imperceptibly recognize their truth before they realize that they destroy Aristotle's principles. These six meditations in question are from his most famous work, The Meditations on First Philosophy. This is the cover right here. I think it's striking to see how self-aware Descartes was of the subversiveness of his philosophy. He says that his philosophy destroys Aristotle's principles, and that he hopes that his readers will imperceptibly recognize their truth before they realize that they contradict their beliefs. His strategic outlook ultimately failed uh, because his books were placed on the Index Librorum Prohibitorum, or the list of prohibited books in the 1660s, which meant that his works were suppressed by the church. Interestingly, uh, the French government even outlawed the teaching of his philosophy in schools. So even though he tried to be secret about, uh, secretive about uh, his, his, the revolutionary nature of his philosophy, he, he totally failed in that respect. Now, what was it about Descartes' philosophy that was so controversial that it made the church and the government suppress his thought? One reason might be that his philosophy was fundamentally at odds with the established ways of thinking. As I've already said, Descartes rejected most of the important Aristotelian doctrines, so the disagreement runs very deep. But there's something radical about Descartes' philosophy that makes it particularly shocking, especially for the Christian practitioners of Aristotelian science. And at the time, most people working on science were indeed Christian. Uh, I mentioned uh, that Descartes is often described as the father of modern philosophy and that he was an important influence on the scientific revolution. I also mentioned that Descartes self-consciously took his mission to be nothing less than the overturn of science's foundations. All of these strands will become a little bit clearer after I explain Descartes' picture of the world. Descartes was what we now call a mechanist. As the term suggests, the notion of mechanism is central to Descartes' philosophy. Descartes believed that everything in nature, with only a few uh, privileged exceptions, could be explained like a mechanism is, is explained. How do we explain a mechanism? We simply refer to the motion of its parts. When a mechanical clock's hands turn, they turn in accord with the rules of its physical parts. The arrangement of the clock's parts and their physical interactions determine the clock's behavior entirely. For Descartes, just about everything could be explained in the same way in principle, even if we didn't have the means to explain it at that time because it was maybe too complex. The idea was, <clears throat> eventually, we could get to a point where we could explain that complex uh, phenomenon uh, in a mechanistic way. For example, animals, such as ducks, would have been viewed as elaborate machines with extremely intricate physical parts. The duck's internal organs and its various internal systems might be analogous to the clock's gears on this view. This view of nature has unsettled people for centuries. Not only is it anathema to the final causes and substantial forms that I mentioned earlier when talking about Aristotelian science, it seems downright blasphemous to claim, against many, relig against many religious doctrines, that animals don't have souls and are ultimately virtually identical to complex machines. And while Descartes believed that humans were partially exempt from this kind of mechanistic ex explanation, he still believed that all the body's somatic functions could be explained mechanistically. In the Cartesian picture of the world, humans are something like souls residing in incre incredibly complex machines. Now that's an informal characterization of Descartes' overall philosophy, but we could do more to get into the technical details about how he defended these views. For that, we'll have to delve into his most famous text, The Meditations, and talk in greater detail about his metaphysics. Now, I said at the start of this lecture that I wanted to avoid prejudicing my audience in any way about the definition of philosophy. But I'm forced to use a definition here to explain what exactly metaphysics is, because the word isn't very common. So I'm not sure many, many in my audience will know exactly what I mean by, by Descartes' metaphysics. I have a Google definition here. It says that metaphysics is the branch of philosophy that deals with the first principles of things including abstract concepts such as being, knowing, substance, cause, identity, time, and space. 
So metaphysics, very roughly, is the philosophical subdiscipline which deals with the nature of reality. In metaphysics, we discuss what exists, how they interact, what kinds of existence are fundamental, and so on. It is an abstract subdiscipline which doesn't perform any experiments of its own because its subject is more general than that of physics or any other science. To proceed in metaphysics, then, we must argue rationally. Of course, this often fails because we're all pretty stupid. <laughs> At the end of the day, we're all just apes. Uh, so it's difficult to see how uh, us as apes could fathom the fundamental structure of reality itself. Uh, so as a result, metaphysics is occasionally the subject of ridicule, as we can see here with the added definition, uh, abstract theory with no basis in reality. But we can at least try to come up with the best theory we possibly can and evaluate our own arguments rationally. We should try to interpret Descartes as performing this kind of exercise. So here's another quote. The whole of philosophy is like a tree, whose roots are metaphysics, whose trunk is physics, and whose branches are all the other sciences, which may be reduced to three principal sciences, medicine, mechanics, and morals. Some of the meanings of Descartes' words here are archaic, so I'll try to translate a little bit. By the whole of philosophy, Descartes means all knowledge. All knowledge for Descartes is included in philosophy. So if we were to diagram a map of human knowledge represented as a tree, Descartes would claim that the roots of the tree are metaphysics. Now, the roots of a tree need to be in place for the, the tree to stand, grow, uh, and, and stand at all, so we can gather that Descartes places a great importance on his metaphysics as the foundation for his scientific work. As previous quotes have amply shown, he thought that his metaphysics would pave the way for the acceptance of the new science, the mechanistic science. Now, earlier I said it was no surprise that in the 17th century, many people would be interested in attaining certain knowledge, given the tumult of the time. Descartes was no exception. So after paving away the old science, he wanted to set science on a firm and certain path. Philosophically, his strategy is as follows. 1. Destroy the foundations of Aristotelian science. 2. Rebuild the foundations again with a new metaphysics which is suited for science, and three, build up philosophy again, this time, certainly. The first task, that of the destruction of the foundation of Aristotelian science, receives its most dramatic expression in meditations. Descartes assumes in meditations the position of the skeptic. As he says in the first meditation, it is now some years since I detected how many were the false beliefs that I had uh, from my earliest youth admitted as true, and how doubtful was everything I had since constructed on this basis. And for that time, I was convinced that I must once and for all seriously undertake to rid myself of all the opinions which I had formerly accepted, and commence to build anew from the foundation if I wanted to establish any firm and permanent structure in the sciences. Note that this is exactly what we've been saying about what Descartes wants to do. He wants to set science on a firm path. Importantly, he says that it, he, he is undertaking to rid himself of all the opinions which he had formerly accepted. All these opinions are, of course, uh, Aristotelian opinions. So how does he accomplish this philosophically? I'll make a distinction here between two kinds of skepticism to illuminate which kind of skepticism Descartes is adopting for his purposes. The distinction is between local skepticism and global skepticism. Local skepticism is confined to particular cases. So whenever we say in ordinary language that someone is skeptical, we are typically describing a mental state. For example, I might say that I'm skeptical that you could mathematically prove that there are infinities that are greater than other infinities, but I have no argument for this claim, and it's actually been proven mathematically that there are infinities that are greater than other infinities. But this doesn't mean that local skepticism is always without an argument. Even if my skepticism about, about some claim had an argument for it, let's go back to the point about infinities. Uh, I could say that infinity is by definition an uncountable sum, so if I were to claim that there are differently sized infinities, I'd only be misunderstanding the definition of infinity, because uncountable sums can't be said to be different sized, uh, being uncountable. Irrespective of whether that argument I just made is a good one or not, it's a very particular in instance of skepticism. I am using an argument to be skeptical of the claim that there are differently sized infinities. I could be skeptical about only this claim, for instance, 
that there are infinities greater than other infinities, and be totally credulous about all other claims. Now, on the other hand, global skepticism, as the world global implies, is a much broader kind of skepticism. It is a skepticism directed towards every single possible claim. So while local skepticism is, as I said, confined to particular cases, like I might be skeptical that uh, the claim the Earth is flat is true, or I might be skeptical of the, the claim that I use as an, exa as an example, uh, there are differently sized infinities, uh, I could be only skeptical about these things while remaining credulous or believing in all kinds of other things. Global skepticism is a skepticism about everything. Nobody is ever skeptical in the global sense seriously, unironically. It doesn't really work like that. Like, how could you live your life being skeptical about literally every single thing? <laughs> but as a philosophical strategy, it poses interesting challenges for foundational theories, and this is the kind of skepticism that Descartes uses against Aristotelian science to show that his theory is more philosophically sound. So it's a more technical kind of, kind of skepticism and one that usually has to be supported by an argument to, to stand up at all. Again, you, can't, you really can't go about living your life and doubting everything. It's just not possible. So with this distinction made clear, we might wonder, why does Descartes doubt absolutely everything? This is because Descartes believed in foundationalism. We might think back to the quote I mentioned earlier. Metaphysics is the root of the tree of philosophy. So to make this claim the claim that metaphysics is the root of the tree of philosophy, one would have to believe that certain kinds of knowledge are more fundamental than others. And, since metaphysics is the dif discipline which discusses the fundamental structure of reality, what other candidate would be able to perform this fundamental role? Zooming in a little bit more, Descartes thinks that since all knowledge is built up from foundations as a superstructure, in the same kind of way a house is, if you look at the diagram of built here, the foundations would be the rectangles, and the structure, the superstructure, would be the would be the triangle. So again, this is the, the in the same way that a house is sort of built. If he can successfully doubt the foundations of Aristotelian science with global skepticism, and his own Cartesian foundations survive global skepticism unscathed, then this would be a mark in favor of his system over Aristotle's. Now. This would be what he calls what, well, actually, I don't think Descartes calls it this, but this is what is referred to as the method of doubt. By doubting everything, he can try and figure out what is more or less uh, unscathed by the doubt. So how does Descartes proceed to doubt everything? He uses three skeptical arguments. The first one is the argument from sensory deception. He claims here that we are dece deceived by our senses here and there, and that this is a reason to doubt that our knowledge of the world is reliable. This is not a globally skeptical argument, but it does seem to de do damage to uh, Aristotelian science because Aristotelian science believes that we can intuitively determine the substantial forms of natural entities. If we are deceived in sense experience, like when we look down a railroad track and see that its tracks converge at a point in the distance when we know that really they're straight and don't converge, then we can doubt some of our knowledge about the world, and consequently the claim that we can de determine the substantial forms of natural entities. But this argument is too weak to be a serious concern. He makes a stronger argument shortly after introducing the argument from sensory deception. This is the so-called dreaming argument. There is some disagreement uh, among philosophers about what exactly Descartes intended by this argument, but in its broadest outlines, the argument runs something like this. 1. Sometimes we take objects to exist in reality when they exist only in our dreams. 2. There is no intrinsic difference between illusory dream experiences and veridical waking experiences. The word veridical means coinciding with reality. This seems true, <coughs> although I do not find that my dreams, my own dreams, uh, are especially vivid or lifelike, enough that, they've, that I've thought that, uh, you know, enough that it can seem like it was veridical. Other people report to me that they do find their dreams especially vivid or lifelike. Enough that they've thought that their experiences and their dreams were veridical. The word veridical, as I said, means coinciding with reality. So, of course, if our dreams do not coincide with reality, 
That's where the problem kicks in. The conclusion of this argument is three, therefore we may be dreaming all the time. Some commentators object to this formulation of the argument. They say that Descartes never intended for the dreaming argument to conclude as strongly as we may be dreaming all the time. These commentators prefer the weaker conclusion that we may be dreaming at any time or something like that. The reason for this being uh, that the latter conclusion avoids the implication that the argument is self-refuting. Let's suppose that the formulation of uh, the argument on the slide is correct, the one with the, the stronger conclusion. Then if the conclusion is true, it doesn't seem like we could know that there is a difference at all between dream experiences and veridical waking experiences. <clears throat> that would be the second premise. So the second premise seems to be refuted by the conclusion of the argument. So the argument is self-refuting. Uh, if the conclusion is true, it doesn't seem like we could know that there's a difference at all between dream experiences and veridical waking experiences. Now, I won't comment here on whether these are good uh, objections or arguments at all. But I'll hint that I think the weaker reading is more true to what Descartes was trying to get at. But even so, I've kept a stronger formulation to give you an idea of how skepticism works. The stronger conclusion is a properly global skepticism. <clears throat> if the stronger conclusion is true, how could I know with certainty anything at all? Because it's possible I'm dreaming at any time. Everything that I've ever experienced up to now, even my experience of presenting this lecture, could be a long, long dream like a Junji Ito horror story. But the weaker conclusion raises a, like a weaker global skepticism. It raises the point that I could be dreaming at any time, but this means that I do have uh, veridical experiences that are true. It's just a, that at any moment, I may or may not be dreaming up a veridical experience, which means I can't be certain that my experiences are veridical and true. <clears throat> do you see the difference here? It's a, it's a difference in degree, almost. Now, this argument is interesting, but it's not the most damaging argument Descartes has in his theoretical toolbox. The most damaging argument Descartes has is the argument from deception by an evil or malicious demon or an evil genius. It should already sound much stronger than the previous arguments. Descartes points out that he believes in God. Everyone at the time also believed in God. But if they believed in God, an omnipotent and omniscient being, they could also conceive of an omnipotent and omniscient demon who deceives you into believing that you're having veridical experiences at all times. When you really aren't. <laughs> when you really aren't. A modernized version of this thought experiment is the brain in a vat thought experiment, uh, which is depicted here, where a disembodied brain is placed in a vat and stimulated neurally with a computer simulation that feeds, so to speak, seemingly real experiences to the brain. So the brain might think that they're out for a jog and experience this very vividly. The wind against their, uh, their, their body, the sweat coming down their face, the strain in their muscles when they run. But actually, they, they're, they're not out for a jog, and they're, they're, they're just a stationary brain stuck in a vat, being deceived by some unethical scientists. This is a properly global skepticism. It's a form of skepticism so strong that Descartes says even mathematical truths are susceptible to doubt. So going back to the brain in a vat thought experiment, if I'm just a brain in a vat then every single one of my experiences is false. Every single one of them. Whether I'm, like, if I think I'm jogging, that's false. I'm just a brain vat. I'm just a goddamn brain vat. I, you know, I could, I could just, I, I could be presenting a lecture. False. I'm just a brain vat. I'm just a brain vat. Uh, now, Descartes adds that he thinks that the uh, omnipotence of the demon means that mathematical statements even are susceptible, susceptible to doubt. So not even 1 plus 1 would equal 2 because the evil demon could trick you into thinking somehow that 1 plus 1 equals 3 or something like that. Of course, we can't conceive how it would be that 1 plus 1 wouldn't equal 2, but we can indirectly conceive of this if we think about the omnipresent power of the evil demon. If we are deceived into believing falsely that our experiences are veridical, then what could we possibly believe? Now, of course, Aristotelian science is no help in this situation. 
Not only did Aristotelian science take some damage in the earliest, earlier skeptical arguments, it seems like Aristotelian science is robbed of one of its most powerful features with these skeptical arguments, the ability to discern the substantial forms in nature. Because in such a situation, how could we possibly discern anything at all about nature, much, le much less their substantial forms? We could be mistaken that an animal is in some location at some time. It could be that an animal that we see in some location at some time was never actually there to begin with, and that we were being deceived by an evil demon into thinking that it was. And so on and so forth. So if I'm not even correct that an animal is there in the first place, then how could I possibly know that I'm understanding the substantial forms of that animal? Now, Descartes' solution is uh, is itself a little bit too complicated to cover here in detail, unfortunately. Uh, and I wanted to go over the problem, the skeptical problem, more so than his solution. His solution, I will note, also is not really uh, accepted nowadays. It is contested very heavily by modern philosophers. Uh, some philosophers think that his, um, his arguments uh, for God's existence fail. Some other philosophers uh, believe that his substance metaphysics, which I will be going into uh, a little bit later, uh, fails for some other reasons. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give an overview real quick about uh, what exactly he does. Uh, and then we'll, we'll and then we'll return to talk about his metaphysics and then conclude the lecture. So Descartes claims, that we can actually obtain certain knowledge which escapes this skepticism that we can use as the foundations for metaphysics. His argument, the famous cogito ergo sum, if you've heard that phrase, uh, it's in English, uh, I think, therefore I am. That's, it's, it, the argument is as follows. But I have convinced myself that there is absolutely nothing in the world. I, I'm quoting Descartes here, by the way. No sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Does it now follow that I too do not exist? No. If I convinced myself of something or thought anything at all, then I certainly existed. But there is a deceiver of supreme power and cunning who deliberately and constantly deceives me. In that case, I too undoubtedly exists. Exist if he deceives me. And let him deceive me as much as he can. He will never bring it about that I am nothing so long as I think that I am something. So, after considering everything very thoroughly, I must finally conclude that the proposition I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever I put it forward by, uh, when it, whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. So here Descartes is saying that whenever he's deceived, it must be true that he exists to be deceived, because the very fact of the deception seems to render denying that he exists absurd. So, like... How could, an, how could an evil demon deceive a non-existent being? That seems absurd. It seems like it makes no sense. So from this, he concludes that he must exist. The argument, however, is contested on many grounds. This is another place where Descartes' philosophy is uh, rejected by modern philosophers. For example, it seems like it requires the knowledge of a claim like all deception involves a party who is deceived who also exists. Uh, and if we can indirect, and if we can indirectly doubt the truth of logically necessary propositions like one plus one equals two, uh, then it seems difficult to accept that this claim can ex escape doubt. Uh, another exception has been that even if a thing is deceived, it doesn't follow that the thing is a thinking thing, as Descartes claims. Now, after this, Descartes argues that God exists. Once he proves that God exists by using an ontological argument, uh, an argument which I will not go over here. Uh, because it's very complicated and uh, sort of difficult to understand. Uh, he argues that since God is good, he wouldn't deceive us in our clear and distinct ideas. Our clear and distinct ideas are typically logical and mathematical truths. Here we see that Descartes accepts some uses of intuition in philosophy. And then using clear and distinct ideas and the assurance that God is not a deceiver, that God is uh, really... Uh, that God has really created us to understand true ideas in the world... Uh, he proves that the external world exists. Now, I know this is all very rough, but this is because I want to look deeper at Descartes' metaphysics. So by the end of Meditations, Descartes believes that he's proved that he exists, that God exists, and that the external world exists. What does this say about his metaphysics? Now, Descartes was a substance dualist. 
The word substance should be familiar because we've already encountered it in the context of Aristotelian science. However, with Descartes, it takes on a new meaning. You will remember that Aristotelians understood science, uh, substances as distinct individuals. Descartes was well aware of this meaning, but interpreted it to mean something much more general and abstract. So to put it a little bit more formally, I'll go over Eustatius of St. Paul's definition. A substance is a being that subsists or exists per se, where to subsist or exist per se is nothing other than not to exist in a something else, uh, as in a subject of inherence, in which a substance differs from an accident, which cannot exist per se, but only some in something else in which it inheres. Intuitively, this means that substances don't depend on anything else to exist. While it's intuitively true that in some sense, uh, particular individuals like dogs or humans don't depend on anything else to exist or exist per se, Descartes did not think that this notion was general enough. What, for example, do dogs consist in? Their constitution determines their being. So the dog de depends on the things that the dog is made of. This is where Descartes' arguments for the external world matter because he takes himself to a proven that physical things exist. These kinds of things are what Descartes would refer to as res extensa, or extended things. Extended things have a couple of defining properties. They're extended, so to speak, in space, which excludes the possibility that another extended thing could be located in the same exact place at the same exact time. The latter property of res extensa is called impenetrability. So we have at least one substance, corporeal bodily physical substance. But Descartes, as I mentioned before, did not believe that humans could be fully explained in a mechanistic way, and in any case he was a believer of God. So he also believed that there was a mental substance of res cogitans. This is Descartes' famous dualism, so named because he holds that everything that exists must fit in either one of the two categories. It must be either a thinking thing or an extended thing. To go a little bit deeper with Descartes' views on substance, Descartes held that substances had modes and principal attributes. We might wonder how material things, like dogs and so on, might, re might be related to substance. Descartes relied on the notion of modes or accidents. A mode is an, an, an instantiation of the various properties that a substance may have. For instance, let's say that there are exactly four atoms in the world. We could make various shapes out of these four atoms, like a perfect square, a rectangle, a parallelogram, a rhombus, a tetrahedron. Every single one of these arrangements of these four atoms would be a different mode of extended substance because they take on different forms, but they would nonetheless remain uh, all, they would all be extended substance, even throughout these changes. So modes depend on substances. And I said earlier that there are two defining properties of uh, res extensa. Defining properties like extension and impenetrability in extended substance uh, are referred to as principal attributes. That is a principal attribute. It is a defining property, something that is essential to that thing. For Descartes, thinking things had their principal attribute in thinking, and their modes were the different kinds of thoughts. Now, this, is, this brings up a little bit of a problem for Descartes. This is, where, this is another place where many people believe that Descartes' philosophy fails. He has this dualism, mental substance and physical substance, res cogitans and res extensa, uh, and he sets them up in such a way that they have different principal attributes. So the principal attribute of res, res, uh, res extensa is extension and impenetrability, whereas the principal attribute of mental substance is res, cos res cogitans. Their modes are also completely different, it follows from this, right? So the, the modes of a mental substance would always have to be thinking because the principal attribute of res cogitans is thought. So every single mode of mental substance would have to be purely mental, would have to be purely thinking. And then we have the same sort of thing for res extensa. Every, since, the, since the principal attribute of, of res extensa is in being extended, every single possible mode, uh, and you know, it doesn't really matter what exactly the modes are here, but let's, let's just use me, my own body, as an, ex, as an example here. My body is a mode of extended substance, right? And my mind, 
is me- is a mental substance. I ha- to to be able to think every time I think <coughs> that is the act that is the action of a mental substance. Now, since it's clear, it's very clear and obvious that I can think and that I can order my body to do things. This seems to bring up a problem for Descartes' philosophy. What exactly is the way that these two substances interact? Because Descartes believes that these substances are really distinct. They are totally, absolutely distinct. Their modes are not the same. Their principal attributes are not the same. If these two substances are distinct, how could they ever interact? How could they ever cause each other? For example, it seems is pretty obvious how uh, you know extended substance could cause other extended substance, right? So a physical mode, right? I am myself a mode of uh, extended substance. It seems very obvious, right, that I can I can interact with physical things. I can go about in my environment and pick physical things up or throw them or you know like I could throw a brick through my through my window. <laughs> I won't do that, right? But it's clear that there's a causal relationship there between what I'm doing physically and what the brick is doing physically with the glass, right? These things are coming into contact with each other and causing each other by contacting each other. In fact, this feature of Descartes' metaphysics is one of its most important aspects. Without this notion of cause among physical substances, Descartes would not be able to have... uh, many of the features that made his philosophy so scientific and radical. This is exactly why, you know, whenever you think about science now, we typically tend to think of uh, trying to explain things without reference to anything supernatural. We try to come up with explanations of, uh, of things that are physical, more or less, at the end of the day. Like in neuroscience, we want to talk about the brain... Uh, and, you know, how people think by examining the brain, the physical structure of the brain itself, rather than some kind of, um, you know, by, rather than some kind of speculation about what, what the soul does or how the soul thinks. Right, and, and that's exactly where the problem lies. Descartes seems to believe in this kind of notion of the soul, but the soul is a mental substance, and its modes are mental, purely mental. Its principal attribute is mental. Its 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 principal attribute is thought. How could thought, how could mental substances ever possibly interact or come into contact with extended substances? As I said, right, whenever I pick up a brick or something like that or throw it at a window, it's obvious how these causal re- relations are taking place. I am coming into contact with the brick. The brick comes into contact with the window. But it's not so obvious how a mental substance could come into contact with a physical substance. How exactly does a mental substance, which is purely mental, purely mental, not corporeal, right? It is not extended. Mental substance is not extended. How could it then interact with with extended substances? This is the problem brought up by Elizabeth of of Bohemia, and it's the mind-body interaction problem. It's something that's still discussed in philosophy to this day, although in a much different form. It's it's been a very, very bizarre sort of conundrum that uh, nobody's really been able to solve. And uh, on that note, I'd like to finish the lecture. Uh, I've gone through about everything I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I hope that was even slightly interesting or illuminating. And uh, once again, a massive thank you to the University of Obst Club. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.